And this is the first time we've been back in this house since 1985, and uh, it, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a strange feeling. I think her panties mm -hmm. were there. Mm -hmm. And, um, and they had been cut off of her. Yeah, yes, ma'am. And so I started giving her, but she would put her hands around the glass and just try to force it, you know, because she was so thirsty. They were just precious, you know, precious little girls. Just, I think more than anything, I was just talking to myself saying, wait, this can't be him. He was the last person any of us would have thought. He was never violent. Doesn't, doesn't make it any better. I mean, he did what he did now. And, uh, and we've lost him. Number three. Timothy Hennis. On May 12, 1985, Mother's Day started out like any other day. However, tragedy struck as people gradually learned of the gruesome slayings of the wife and two daughters of Captain Gary Eastburn. It is not certain how it all went down on May 9, 1985, but what is known is that Katie Eastburn and two of her three daughters were destroyed. On that fateful Sunday, the Eastburn's neighbor, Army Sergeant Bob Seafeld, arrived home after bailing out one of his soldiers. Upon his return, his worried wife pointed out that papers were piling up on the Eastburn's doorstep. And the family car was still in the driveway, with the baby stroller parked in its usual place by the back door. Bob realized he hadn't seen the Eastburns in at least three days, and decided to investigate. Upon stepping up to the front door, Bob received no answer. He called the Eastburns babysitter, Julie Cerniak, who rushed over. As Bob waited outside the Eastburn house, Julie peeked into the window and saw baby Jenna standing alone in her crib with outstretched arms. They were just precious, you know, precious little girls. Rang the doorbell and uh, didn't get any, uh, any answer. It sounded like a baby was crying. And what about Katie? Did you get to know her at all? I would say she's the most devoted mother I'd ever seen. So I just laid her down on in my bathroom on the rug there and I changed her. I grabbed an old t-shirt. Julie began looking for a possible way into the home, but Bob convinced her to wait for the arrival of the police. Officer William Toman was the first to arrive and he forced open the window to retrieve the crying infant and a stack of diapers, saying he smelled something horrible but never expected what was to come. They discovered the remains of the family. Then I went to the kitchen table with her and I had a glass of milk, you know. Her little teeth were really black from, I guess, dehydration. And so I started giving it, but she would put her hands around the glass and just try to force it, you know, because she was so thirsty. So what happened? The Eastburn family was planning to relocate to England so that Eastburn could take up a liaison job with the Royal Air Force. Katie had made arrangements to rehome the family's English setter, Dixie posting an advertisement in the local newspaper, Beeline Grab Brag. On May 7, 1985, 27-year-old U.S. Army Sergeant Timothy Hennis responded to the ad and visited the Eastburn family home. Hennis's young family owned a Spitz at the time. After chatting with Katie, Hennis took Dixie home. A few days later, Bob visited with the police officer and discovered the remains of Katie, Kara, and Aaron. I at my mother's house at the time because it was Mother's Day. It was right around between 12, 30, and 1. You know, because she was so thirsty, you know. Her little teeth were really black from, I guess, dehydration. Here, in this area here, was her sneakers. This is the room in which Jana was left. She was left in this room. Was in the crib. In the crib, in here. And this is the first time we've been back in this house since 1985. And uh, it, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a strange feeling. I think her panties mm -hmm. were there. First thing I said, how many of them are dead? Kaplan and a couple other people came, and I got on a plane with a friend of mine that escorted me back. Katie was over about where the edge of this bed is. Was pulled apart, oh. plows and bra, pull stab wounds to her chest, and also her throat had been cut. Uh, that's the picture I see. And, uh, Kara and, and Aaron and, and Katie, and uh, you, you don't ever forget. Her throat was cut. Mm -hmm. Both, both of them. stab wounds. A lot of things come back to you a lot of things. Some things you've forgotten. That scene. Uh, I had a glass of milk and so I started giving it but she would put her hands around the glass and just try to force it. Katie had been stripped to the waist, physically exploited and knifed 15 times. Aaron had been hit with a blunt object. The youngest child, Jenna, survived the attack but was dehydrated and suffering from diarrhea. In 1986, Timothy Hennis was tried and convicted for the three slayings 
In 2010, he was tried and convicted again by an army court martial for the same crimes and sentenced to his end. That I got the call and uh, I proceeded over to Summer Hill. I was in fact at my mother's house at the time because it was mother's day. It was right around between 12, 30 and 1. Number 2. Nidal Hassan Nidal Malik Hassan was a U.S. Army major and psychiatrist who committed the Fort Hood shooting on November 5, 2009, slaughtering 13 people and injuring more than 30 others. The shooting is considered the deadliest mass shooting at a U.S. military installation. Hassan was born in Arlington, Virginia on September 8, 1970 to Palestinian immigrant parents. After completing his undergraduate degree at Virginia Tech, Hassan joined the U.S. Army in 1997 and received his medical degree from the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences in 2003. Hassan's colleagues and superiors noted his growing disillusionment with the military and his increasing religious extremism in the years leading up to the shooting. Hassan had previously expressed support for bombings and had been in contact with Anwar al-Awalaki, an al-Qaeda leader. Hassan had also been reprimanded for forcing his Islamic beliefs on patients and colleagues, which violated army regulations. On the morning of the shooting, Hassan reported for duty at Fort Hood's Soldier Readiness Processing Center. Hassan then entered a building and began firing his handgun at unarmed soldiers, slaying 13 and injuring over 30 others. Hassan was eventually shot and paralyzed from the waist down by police officer Kimberly Munley, who was later awarded the Defense of Freedom Medal for her actions. Hassan was charged with 13 counts of premediated slaying and 32 counts of attempted slaying. The trial began in August 2013 and Hassan represented himself in court. During the trial, Hassan admitted to the shooting and stated that he had carried it out in defense of the Taliban in Afghanistan. The prosecution argued that the shooting was an act of terrorism, while Hassan argued that it was a justified act of war. In August 2013, Hassan was found guilty on all counts and was sentenced to his end. He is currently on a military row at Fort Leavenworth in Kansas. In 2015, Hassan wrote a letter to the leader of ISIS expressing his support for the terrorist group and requesting to become a citizen of the caliphate. The letter was intercepted by authorities and released to the public. In the letter, Hassan stated that he had been radicalized by Anwar al-Awlaki and that he believed that the United States was at war with Islam. The Fort Hood shooting remains one of the deadliest attacks on a U.S. military installation and has had lasting impacts on the military community. You're, you're just unable to believe. You still have to keep asking yourself and pinching yourself, is this really what happened? He wouldn't kill a bug in the house. What do you think he changed? I don't know. This is a very different person than the one you describe. Just, I think more than anything, I was just talking to myself saying, wait, this can't be him. He was the last person any of us would have thought. He was never violent. Doesn't, doesn't make it any better. I mean, he did what he did now. And, uh, and we've lost him. Number one, Hassan Karim Akbar. Hassan Karim Akbar, formerly known as Mark Fidel Cools, was born on April 21st, 1971 in Watts, Los Angeles, California. His father, John Cools, changed his name to Akbar after converting to Islam while in prison for a gang-related charge. Akbar's mother also converted to Islam and changed her son's name to reflect his father's surname and their religion. Akbar enrolled at the University of California, Davis, in 1988, but his studies were interrupted several times, leading to a delayed graduation. He joined the Reserve Officers Training Corps but did not receive a commission and eventually joined the Army as an enlisted member due to financial difficulties. In March 2003, Akbar, then a sergeant, was stationed at Camp Pennsylvania, a U.S. military encampment in Kuwait, preparing for the invasion of Iraq. In the early hours of March 23, 2003, Akbar turned off a power generator and threw four M67 fragmentation hand grenades into three tents where other members of the division were sleeping causing fatal injuries to five people and injuring 14 others. Akbar also fired his M4 rifle at fellow soldiers, causing further injuries. He was convicted in 2005 and sentenced to his demise for the slaying of two people. Since Army Major Nidal Hassan opened fire on the Fort Hood military base, killing 13 people. He decided to talk about his cousin Nidal because he deeply believes the influence of extremists turned him into a different person. Devastation. I mean, clearly condemnation. I mean, he wouldn't kill a bug in the house. What do you think he changed? I don't know. This is a very different person than the one you described. I'm saying, wait, this can't be him. He was the last person any of us would have thought. He was never violent. 
ever. I mean, he did what he did now, and, uh, and we've lost. And then all of a sudden, four months later, September 11th happens. Now that you might see that as your first challenge as to how much do you believe in your faith. No, we were never, he would, we would fast, that was Same thing. Kid, play soccer, catch, butter, catch fireflies. Akbar's military defense attorneys argued that he had psychiatric problems, including paranoia, irrational behavior, insomnia, and sleep disorders. Akbar's conviction marked the first time since the Vietnam War that a soldier had been convicted of fragging or intentionally slaying fellow soldiers during wartime. He has spent over 17 years on the row and remained confined at the United States Disciplinary Barracks while awaiting the disposition of a sentence. The Army Court of Criminal Appeals affirmed Akbar's fatal sentence in July 2012, and the United States Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces upheld the decision in August 2015. It was his mom's wish. No God. And so he started praying more and becoming more pious. Do you think that uh, Al-Qaeda, terrorists, is the ones that influence to the point where... Still not privy to any of the, the alleged, you know, emails between uh, him and, and Anwar al-Awlaki, God and country. And I think that's where his sickness really started to... I don't know. I believe that maybe some of the things that are seen on the internet, some of the websites... If you had known what was possibly going to happen, would you have turned him in? Absolutely. Without question. You saw nothing like that? Nope. Senate investigation called this the ticking time bomb. I guess potentially more violent as, as time moved on. Should this be temporary insanity? He committed a crime. I don't think there's any question as to who the shooter was. The FBI come to our house right away. If there was anybody else out there that we... He should get the death penalty? I don't believe in death penalty. Um, that's going to be left up to the jury. That's all for today's video. See you next time.